my belief is that people aren't going to give up a behavior that's pleasurable in the present if there's nothing that they think can replace it that's more pleasurable. So I ask people to really think through their vision of the future. How would they like to have lived their lives at the end of it? What would they like to be true of them? How do they want to be remembered? And I, we ask very detailed questions about that. And the idea is to have the person really take a look and see if the way they're living their lives now is going to get them to that place or not. And if it's not, what changes do they need to make to move more in that direction? Welcome to Spark Joy, the podcast dedicated to celebrating the KonMari method and the transformative power of surrounding yourself with joy and letting go of all the rest. With your hosts and certified KonMari consultants, Kristen Ivey and Karen Sochi. And now, here's the show. Are you a shopaholic? Whether you answer, heck yeah, or I'm not sure... This episode is for you. Today, we'll explore the connection between clutter and consumption. Poor buying habits and patterns are often a silent culprit. No matter how intentional you may be with your spark joy decision making, excessive shopping can severely compromise and derail your ability to either finish your KonMari tidying event or maintain a tidy home and lifestyle long term. This is why we've invited Dr. April Lane Benson to Spark Joy today. Dr. Benson is a nationally known psychologist specializing in the study and treatment of compulsive buying disorder. Author of To Buy or Not to Buy, Why We Overshop and How to Stop, she offers individual evidence-based coaching and a comprehensive website, shopaholicnomore.com, which is filled with information and effective strategies. Welcome to Spark Joy, Dr. Benson. Uh, thank you so much for having me, Kristen. Welcome. We're so glad you're here. Thanks, Karen. So my very first question, Dr. Benson, is this. How on earth did you become an expert in compulsive shopping and buying disorders? I'm very interested in learning about your journey and how you came to be an expert in this field. Well, it actually had to do with the closing of my favorite store. Hmm. Oh. When I was about 40. And uh, the store I'd shopped in for 20 years, and I learned a great deal from shopping at that store. And I had experiences that felt to me like they were very healing. The message I had gotten from my mother was a double one. Yes, it's okay to look good and buy beautiful things, but not really. And so my own shopping behavior was very confused, and I got great attention and help in this store, and they didn't permit me to overshop. So when the sto- I, know, I found out the store was closing, I wrote what for me was a eulogy to the store which was an essay called When Shopping Heals. And I talked about my childhood experience of shopping and what that store had done for me. And one thing led to another. And I found my workshop. I started giving workshops called When Shopping Heals. And I found it listed in New York Magazine. And I was invited to write a book. And kind of the rest is history. And then I, over time, transitioned from working with people with eating disorders, which has a lot of the same kinds of conflicts, to working with people with shopping disorders. And what I can tell you, pardon the pun, it's been a very hard sell. To this day, I believe that I'm the only psychologist in the country for whom this is my sole specialty. Wow. Because we look the other way. Compulsive buying is called the smiled upon disorder, Mm -hmm. smiled upon addiction, because consumption fuels our economy. Hmm. 
I love how you mentioned that emotional component uh, for sure. That is a big contender when it comes to of kind of managing this type of addiction. And you do classify this as an addiction, correct? Like similar to drugs or alcohol or, or something for in that? For people for whom the impulses are irresistible, they lose control, and they carry on despite adverse consequences. Those are the three cardinal features. But I think compulsive buying exists on a continuum. Mm. So some people have a much harder problem than others. Could you expand a little bit about the why behind over shopping? Why do some folks tend to, you know, really struggle with the way they are buying of goods? There are probably as many answers to that question as there are compulsive buyers. Sure. Because it's a very personal thing. But some of the more common reasons are that people overshop to feel better about themselves or more secure. Maybe they overshop to avoid dealing with something important. Or for one quarter of compulsive buyers, it's been shown that shopping is used as a weapon to express anger or seek revenge. Other overshoppers, compulsive gift givers, for example, Hmm. overshop to try to buy or hold on to love. And it it goes on from there, overshopping to soothe yourself or repair your mood or project an image of wealth and power, to belong to an appearance-obsessed society as a response to stress, loss, trauma. For some people, it's the lesser evil. They may come from a family where there are other addictions, maybe drug and alcohol, and this to them is less damaging than something else they could do. Hmm. People feel more in control sometimes when they're over shopping, if they feel out of control in other parts of their lives. And finally, and this could really seem like a stretch, but overshopping is for some people a way to deny the finality of death. There, in Tennessee Williams' play, the Big Daddy says in, I'm trying to remember the name of the play at the moment. Is it Cat on a Hot Tin Roof? That's it, exactly. (laughs) It's Cat on a Hot Tin Roof, and Big Daddy says in that play, the human beast is an animal that dies, and if he's got money, he buys and buys and buys. And I think the reason he buys everything he can buy is that in the back of his mind, he has the crazy hope that one of his purchases will be life everlasting. This is so interesting. My mind is just racing with thoughts of various clients that I've worked with and um, and just some of the common themes and, and some of the things that you've just touched on really have brought some of that into clarity. Um, You know, I I definitely have had clients who've talked about feeling very, very stressed at work and or home and feeling that the shop clerks at uh, Prada were always so happy to see them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, going into Chanel or Bergdorf's, they they were always... Just it was such a relief to walk in the door and know that they would be treated um, as someone special, and there would be no there would be no um, demands or expectations. Just that they would come in and, and take a look at the beautiful new things that had just arrived, um, yes. and how that just became a part of their routine was to just go into the stores and take a look. And of course, when you're taking a look, it's just so easy to buy things just exactly the same way somebody who had an alcohol issue would walk into a bar just for a little bit of relief. And before you know it, they've, they've drank, you know, in excess. But I'm also thinking about thinking, uh, as you just said about the, the movie Cat on a Hot Tin Roof, also in Citizen Kane, um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with with that movie, which is one of my favorites. Um, At the end, um, the character has just continually shopped the world for rare antiques and filled an enormous, vast warehouse with antiques and statues and and all of these things. And and in a clear effort to to maintain some sense of of, um, immortality. Interesting. I'm going to have to watch that again. Definitely. It's really amazing. Um, and I, I definitely can see some, some parallels in, in some of the things that you were just speaking about. What, the, you know, when you speak about um, uh, compulsive over shopping as, a, uh, as an addiction, I'm interested in what you have seen as some of the, the consequences of this behavior in your work. 
we think mostly of the financial consequences, people who are up to their eyeballs in debt, have no money for retirement. But those are those are really only one category of what I call aftershocks. There's a lot of damage to relationships. There's a lot of dishonesty, conflicts, emotional aftershocks, guilt, shame, depression, work aftershocks. Somebody, for example, who is on the internet two hours a day shopping when they should be doing their work or takes extra long lunch hours because they get entranced by going into a store, or they get passed over for promotions because they're just not paying the kind of attention. There are, as you know, living space aftershocks, the clutter, the immense upset to the living space where one can't use particular spaces for what they're intended. You can't eat on the tables because they're piled with stuff. Even physical body consequences, like not you don't have money for regular checkups or specific medical care. You're so anxious that you're developing high blood pressure. And beyond that, personal development consequences. Somebody who doesn't have the brain space and or the money to develop any of their talents or interests and has lost contact with nature, their lives may feel hollow, you know, spiritual consequences as well. So there are plenty. Wow. So Dr. Benson, with Kunmari, we actually have encountered certain um I guess uh, some of the consequences that you have just mentioned and after our clients pile items of various clutter categories like clothing or books or paper um, in one space, they really confront their uh, consumption behavior and they take a kind of on the spot evaluation. And usually this leads to a break in in these patterns of ambivalence or avoidance that may exist. And we use that kind of break in behavior to catalyze change. How do you suggest that we confront a compulsive buying disorder? Well, I think first you've got to assess whether your client is ready to even think about what's going on as a compulsive buying problem. You know, does the client want to face this? Does the client want help? How can you facilitate a client to take a look? There are questions that you want to ask your client. You might, do you think this client uses shopping as a quick fix for the blues? Do they spend more than they can afford? Are some of their purchases hidden or unused? Do they feel guilty or ashamed about the behavior? Would their life be richer if they were shopping less? And have they tried to change but they haven't been able to? Mm-hmm. You know, if they if if you think the answer is yes and that they would answer yes to these questions, then you may be in a position to help them see that it's a problem that they can take the reins of and that if they don't, all the tidying up in the world isn't going to lead to perpetual tidiness because they're going to keep over acquiring so, Dr. Benson, how would you tell me? How would you separate the this idea of, uh, of compulsive overspending and overshopping as a disorder, along with hoarding as a disorder? I mean, off the top of my head, I'm thinking that that with a hoarding disorder, the the real the issue is actually the things themselves. But I think in shopping disorders, it's more the act of buying. Because I've worked with people who clearly have a shopping disorder, and it, they don't even care that much about the things. It was more just actually buying them that was the draw. That's for, that's true of some compulsive buyers, but others, what they buy is very important to them. 
for the moment. They don't form really strong attachments to the things that they have. So they're, it's easy for them to let go of them mm-hmm. in order to make room for more. Dr. Benson, in your practice, you discuss six major shopping magnets, and um, you talk about how to avoid those. Can you tell us a little bit about that? It's very interesting. Well, we can't necessarily avoid all the shopping magnets, but what we can do is learn how to deal with them and the way in which they're triggering. The first one are malls and standalone stores. And it's not hard to see how they're triggering the, the abundance of stuff, the fact that there are never any clocks there, so you lose track of time. There's this whole science of atmospherics, which is smells, sights, carefully calculated to elicit emotional reactions that incline you to buy. So malls and standalone stores are one. Another a big one now is internet shopping. And it is such a trigger because cookies, which are those little coded files that bring up past purchases when you're making a new one, it's as though the deck is really stacked against you. So there are ways to block those cookies And there are things you can do, like not keeping your credit card information online, making it possible for you to create a pause between the impulse and the action. That's what you want. TV commercials are also a shopping magnet. Just because this woman in this beautiful BMW commercial has hordes of men showering her with Casablanca lilies. It doesn't mean that if you buy the BMW, it's going to happen to you. But that's what, that's the bill of goods that were sold. Magazines, a lot of the editorial in there is purchased by the people that they write about. So it's not really unbiased journalism, catalogs, they tell a story and you think that you're going to have the same story. And TV shopping channels, they are a big, big trigger, in part because the pitch people are taught how to sell in a way that's very personal. They know your name. It's as though they become your friends. And for people who are lonely, or shut in, which is true of many people who are TV shopping addicts. This is a big draw. It's so interesting. When you were speaking, I was thinking about how how this type of an addiction really parallels other types of addictions. The mall sounds like the casino for mm-hmm. somebody who has a gambling addiction. Um, and I love what you just said about internet shopping. I, I, I think it's so funny that when you're shopping for something on Amazon and all of a sudden that same thing is following you around as you go to Facebook yes. and Instagram and there it is. Um, it's really interesting. I just recently moved and I- In my mind, I was thinking I need to get a new shower head. I didn't type it into Google. I didn't put it on Facebook or anything. And sure enough, (laughs) like a sponsored ad for a mowing shopping head or or mowing shower head popped up. And I was like, how is this happening? Even the things I think in my mind (laughs) are forced in front of my or or forced in front of me on the Internet or in in Facebook. I know um, a the biggest shopping magnet that I resonate with would be online shopping. I got myself into a bit of trouble, you know, using clutter to cope uh, with being uncomfortable in certain areas of my life when, and I, Luckily, I found Kanmari and this shed some light on the issue and I was able to return some things and get some money back um, for some of this over shopping. I've, I've definitely uh, been able with time to change my behaviors, but I would love to hear any tips you have for that particular magnet online shopping because I think it's one that a lot of us now uh, encounter. Unsubscribe. Oh, Unsubscribe. Okay. That's the first and probably. <laughs> the most important one. Great. Great tip. Yeah, that's a way to keep uninvited internet retailers from finding you. (laughs) Sure. Upgrade your spam filter, block pop-ups, change your browser settings to restrict cookies. Mm -hmm. 
Great. Don't give your email address to internet vendors. They'll pass it on to their retail partners so they can solicit you too. Sure. <laughs> Don't just get on the internet and start browsing. Just shop for something specific. Great. And remove all shopping milieus from your favorite places. Excellent. It's almost like taking the bad junk food out of the yes. fridge. Same, yes. same idea. Yes. It's not in front of you. You won't be triggered. I love that. Great advice. Availability is a very big factor. Mm -hmm. Dr. Benson, do you find that once that the, the actual, um, the drug, so to speak, of shopping is removed, that your clients then have a lot of um, emotional issues that come to the surface? And then do you work with them as far as addressing, you know, the anxiety disorders that are behind um, a shopping addiction? Yes, that's very much the case. We, I have a very specific program that we use that looks at the behavior from many standpoints, cognitive, affective, behavioral, and people begin by really looking, looking into why they overshop and how it all began and how the past is now informing the present and what they can do to get mindful about that. So, for example, in my childhood, I saw my grandmother taking my mother out for clothes all the time and making sure she hid them so that my father didn't see. So I got the message that you need to really not be transparent about the things that you buy. And we go on from there. And learn, knowing this is going to help me stop over shopping because this is not the situation that I'm confronted with now. It's my own money. There's nobody to hide it from, whatever it is. And then we have, we have people move on from there. My belief is that people aren't going to give up a behavior that's pleasurable in the present if there's nothing that they think can replace it that's more pleasurable. So I ask people to really think through their vision of the future. How would they like to have lived their lives at the end of it? What would they like to be true of them? How do they want to be remembered? And I, we ask very detailed questions about that. And the idea is to have the person really take a look and see if the way they're living their lives now is going to get them to that place or not. And if it's not, what changes do they need to make to move more in that direction? So we go on looking at the triggers and the consequences, their own shopping story, their ambivalence about change. We look at the high cost of credit card debt, the centrality of savings. People start to write down everything they spend every day and assign each expenditure a score based on how necessary they believe it to be, which yields them on a daily and a weekly basis a figure which represents the actual money they spent and a another figure that represents the money they needed to spend. And the difference between the two is the amount of money they could have saved that day, or the amount of money they wasted, or the, the amount of discretionary fluff in their stuff. And we go on to look at self-kindness, self-respect, and self-care as being very important ingredients because often shopping is a shortcut solution to some of issues, some issues related to how somebody feels about themselves. So they really have to develop care and compassion for themselves and find other ways to meet the very important needs that we all have the need for love and affection, the need to belong, the need for self-esteem, the need for the esteem of other people, and the need for autonomy. A lot of people derail those needs and they, they attach them to compulsive buying. They think they're going to feel more loved if they buy the Prada boots. And nothing could be farther from the truth. But that's the idea, 
So we look at tailor-made alternatives. When I have a need to belong, what can I do instead? What else is going to bring me into a situation where I feel I get the kind of attention that I get from a salesperson? What can I do to meet that need? And so we think through all of that. And we look at how the, money, the, the body, the mind, the heart, and the soul can all play into that. People learn how to shop mindfully and with a plan. They, need to, they learn how to deal with lapses and relapses and how to plan for upcoming high-risk situations. And finally, at the very end of the program, we look into ideas like less is more or the cultivation of true wealth, which are those non-financial assets that invigorate and vitalize us. Relationships with animals, with people, communion with nature, volunteer work. So that's kind of how people change. And it's remarkable how satisfying and far-reaching this work can be because people are building muscles to tolerate the discomfort that will come when they stop using that drug of choice. But they build muscles that they can then use to deal with many other areas. They learn to tolerate discomfort and regulate their mood in a way that works for them. That is so interesting how this program is almost like a, a companion to um, the KonMari process in a way. If KonMari uncovers some type of extreme consumption behavior, I know that um, some of my clients have really tied their identity and their entertainment factor and their value really um, very tightly around shopping and consumption. And after completing the KonMari tidying event, the reduction of clutter almost becomes a trigger uh, where mm -hmm. that increased amount of space their reaction is, oh, I've got to fill it because that's what I'm used to doing. That's that's what I, I always have done. Um, so I'm curious if if you ran across someone who just finished hiding and, and it would be leaning on kind of those old spending patterns, how do you suggest they fill the void uh, that shopping really used to satisfy? Well, we really need to look in some depth at what that void is all about and what it is they're looking for. Sure. Because you can never, this is kind of the bottom line, you can never get enough of what you don't really need. So what you've got to figure out is what you really need and how to get that. And it's not that eighth pair of black boots. Love that. <laughs> Well, I have about 58 pairs of shoes fashion <laughs> <laughs> myself, mm -hmm. and all of them spark joy, and I have even pared them down. Um, I really landed on a great number, but um, I definitely have benefited already from your resources, Dr. Benson. I, oh, I'm so glad. I took the Who Needs Help? Three Ways to Know. Are you an mm -hmm. overshopper? It's a free PDF kind of evaluation that you can find on uh, your website, shopaholicnomore.com. And I I really wasn't sure if I had totally recovered from uh, my kind of uh, revelation that I had during Kamari that I was being a little sloppy with my shopping and using it as a tool, you know, to really cope with um, things that weren't quite right emotionally. So I did take your quiz. Um, I was borderline in some of the evaluations, but none over over the edge in terms of red flag shopaholic. But it was very insightful that I'm even, you know, close to being to that, you know, new middle line, because that just tells me that I always need to be conscious uh, that I could possibly relapse and slip back into old behaviors. <laughs> so absolutely. One of the things that people I work with, and in fact, it's in my book too, and on our website, a little mm -hmm. card with six questions on it that I ask people to carry in their wallet or leave by the computer if internet shopping is a trigger. Mm. And these are the six questions. Why am I here? How do I feel? 
Do I need this? What if I wait? How will I pay for it? And where will I put it? Wow. Oh, that's so great. It's like a little manifesto. (laughs) And if you can, first of all, taking the time to think about the questions and answer them preferably in writing gives you that all important space that's power pause, sacred pause between impulse and action. And if you can answer those six questions to your satisfaction, it's probably not a compulsive purchase. Right. Wow. I'm going to jot those down and put them right next to my mouth at all times. (laughs) So Dr. Benson, if someone suspects that they may have a shopping addiction, what would be the first thing for them to do? What would be, where would, where should they turn to get started? Well, if they are ready to deal with this directly, I would, one of the things I'd do is direct them right away to my website because there's so much information and free resources. And I don't think there's anywhere else, at least I haven't seen anywhere else online that has, that is this kind of resource. Debtors Anonymous is a free resource that helps a lot of people. And there are some online support groups. There's a resource section on my website that lists these things. Oh, great. Perfect. And we're curious at this very moment, what sparks the most joy in your life? Well, I have a collection of passion flowers that I love. And I have a little temporary makeshift greenhouse. So in the winter, I can keep them alive. Beautiful. Oh, I love that. I love that. They're such beautiful flowers. And yes, yes, I love them. And my son has a dog and I get to take care of his dog one day a week. That really sparks joy. Ah. (laughs) I have a little four-year-old Yorkie Poo, so I'm definitely a fan of dogs and my dog sparks (laughs) joy every day. (laughs) Yeah. There are a lot of things that spark joy. I'm studying Russian, and that's a lot of fun, and the piano. So I love of learning is probably one of my signature strengths. And part of the program that people do is they take a survey online called the Values in Action Signature Strengths Survey. Millions of people have taken this survey. It's free. And it gives you a printout of your five highest strengths. And in in our program, we ask people to do the survey to to think about how they're going to use those five signature strengths in the service of stopping over shopping. How are they going to marshal their open-mindedness or their appreciation of beauty and excellence or their kindness? How are they going to marshal these strengths to help them? I feel like really the task of managing and helping someone move through a compulsive buying situation and the tidying process, both of those, the connection is it, it really is a, or it breaks down to a values discussion. So I love that you've uh, shared yet another great resource. Um, and we'll make sure that's linked in the show notes because really we all operate and tend to put our time and energy towards things that are of our highest value. Uh, so I think That is kind of the link between these two worlds, tidying and compulsive buying. I think you're right. Mm -hmm. Very cool. And do you have any parting words of wisdom for our listeners? I think people need to know that effective help is available and that this is something to be serious about. Buzz Bissinger, who wrote a, who got a Pulitzer Prize for his book, Friday Night Lights, and had, came out in 2013, I believe, in GQ magazine as a shopping and a sex addict, that despite 
going into rehab, having 20 years of good therapy. He's had a serious relapse. And I think his courage in going on national TV to say that may have been a really important step in his regaining control. Wow. How brave. Interesting. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you so much for sharing your message and helping us kind of bring this uh, addiction that may not be as obvious as an addiction out of the uh, shadows. You are very welcome. We like nothing better than to be able to help people with this, especially because so many people don't take it seriously and there are relatively few resources. So now we want to hear from you. Tell us your burning, tidying questions or share stories about how Kanmari has impacted your life. You can find us at sparkjoypodcast.com and click Ask Spark Joy to leave a question or comment for a chance to be featured on next week's show. While you're there, sign up to join our Spark Joy podcast community and get notified when each episode airs. You can also join the Spark Joy podcast community on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter at the handle at Spark Joy Podcast. Thanks for tuning in, and we hope your day sparks joy. Thank you for listening to Spark Joy with your host, Kristen Ivey, of For the Love of Tidy in Chicago, and Karen Sochi of The Serene Home in New York City. Spark Joy, the podcast is not endorsed by or affiliated with KonMari Media Incorporated. The opinions expressed on this episode represent the views of the co-hosts and guests alone and do not represent the corporate position of KonMari Media Incorporated or the KonMari Consultant Community.